So the Racing Post is here today in Ireland with Carhol Beale, the new Chief Executive of the Irish National Stud. And you've been um, Chief Executive now for three months, so how's the first, um, the first bit gone? Gone well, yeah, yeah. So obviously it takes a little bit of time to settle into the new role. Uh, we've had yearling sales come and go and everything went, went very well. And uh, we're delighted, of course, to announce a, a new stallion arriving in National Defence for 2018. So, so far, so good. And I think it's fair to say when you were announced as the new um, Chief Executive, there was some surprise, but only because of your relative youth, because you're 34 and um, that's relatively young to be in a position like this. Yeah, I suppose it is, yeah, yeah. But I suppose if you look at uh, our current Taoiseach is only 37. Yeah. I think Aidan O'Brien was 25 or six when he took over Bally Doyle. So I suppose age is a relative thing. Like when we receive the students here every year, they think I'm ancient. And can you tell us about your um, background and how you came to be here? Yeah, so I suppose uh, briefly, I, uh, I, I did the Irish National Stud course uh, seven or eight years ago and then went on to Godolphin Flying Start, the Darley Flying Start as it was then, programmed for two years, uh, which was a fantastic opportunity. And from there I went to work at Four Knot Stud and Tinnacle Bloodstock with, uh, with Dermot Cantillon. And I arrived here in January and uh, worked here for six months before taking over the, the role as CEO. Um, so I suppose I've seen it from a, as, a, as a student here, as a client here for seven or eight years, and as, a, as an employee. So I've, I've got the full range of, uh, of sights on it, yeah. Yeah. And um, your predecessor, John Osborne, was quite a stalwart here. Have you spoken to him much? Has he given you much advice about the role? Yeah, it would be foolish not to call on someone of such high standing in the industry and who did such a fabulous job here. But at the same time, you know, I understand that we, we have to progress without John as well, so we move forward. We ha still have the same board, the same team, the same structures, so everything is in place. But yeah, certainly, if and when I need to, I, I pick up the phone. Do you have a vision for the next seven years and the future of the Irish National Stud? You were telling me earlier you were very conscious about the history and 100 years of the Irish National, so where do you want to take it, or is it business as usual? In brief, you know, the Stud was set up 100 years ago by Colonel William Hall Walker, and a couple of remarkable things happened during his tenure. You know, he, he bred seven classic winners in 16 years, so no pressure on me, yeah. um, which was a remarkable achievement. And he bred, of course, the, uh, the Guineas and Derby winner of 1909, Minaroo. But even more importantly, he gifted that horse to the British crown. Uh, so it still remains the only horse to be led in by a reigning monarch uh, to, win the, to win the Epsom Derby. So that was remarkable in itself. But then he also introduced the Aga Khan to racing in Europe, uh, which was another phenomenal achievement and everything that's come from that since. To answer your question, I suppose, to look ahead to the future, it's really to develop those education, tourism, uh, stallion streams of income, not just from a commercial profitability sense, but also for the wider good. You know, our, our stakeholders are the Department of Agriculture and it's to show the effect of good agriculture practices and how that can you know, generate an economic benefit but a social benefit as well with over 29,000 people employed in the industry and, a, and an economy of two billion generated by bloodstock in Ireland every year. It's important for us to be at the forefront of, of telling that story and, and sharing that with people. And the other thing which is um, a huge preoccupation at the moment for horsemen in Britain, Ireland and France is the issue of Brexit. Have you had to consider that much and what do you think it will mean for the Irish National Stud, if anything? Well, I think it's, it's obviously the, the, you know, the biggest risk we face at the moment uh, for many reasons, but you know, HRI and, and their equivalents in Britain and France, I think are all agreed on the necessity of the tripartite agreement. They've done a good job in beating the drum at European level, I know they've been over again recently, to just to highlight the importance of the free movement of animals and people to this industry, like Ireland's bloodstock uh, exports to the UK especially is, is, is obviously a very big percentage of the amount of bloodstock sales we have uh, going anywhere. So the, the continuation of a tripartite agreement, whether that's uh, as part of a Britain outside the EU or not, is, is absolutely vital. Invincible Spirit has been the flagship side for the Irish National Stud over the last few years. He took over from Indian Ridge and I think it's fair to say that there's always been that one sort of horse who carries the stallion roster. And Invincible Spirit's obviously getting on in years now, so are there preparations for life after Invincible Spirit and how the revenue is going to um, come back? 
Yeah, well, I suppose in, in the time before I came, the preparations had always started. It's, it's really a consistent investment over a period of years, and hopefully one or more of those stallions become the next invincible spirit. So, you know, we've Gale Force 10 having his first uh, two-year-olds next season. Dragon Pulse has had a particularly good season. His yearling sales have gone very well. We think he has a very good chance of becoming a really solid horse at a, at a, at a decent level for breeders to use. His winners-to-runners ratio is exceptional. You know, he's a very good stallion for mares to start off with. Uh, Free Eagle, obviously, we have very high hopes for. His first foals have arrived. They've been received with universal acclaim for most breeders, mm -hmm. and we'll have uh, we'll be testing the market with him in a, in, a, in a couple of weeks' time. With 25 going to Goffs and 10 going to Tattersall's new market sale, um, and then obviously we've acquired National Defence as of as of now. And you know he's obviously as the son of Invincible Spirit, a horse we're going to place a lot of faith and a lot of stock in to hopefully. That hopefully the one or more of them can can take up the mantle because obviously you know he's going to be a very hard act to follow. Has it meant that all the different valves of um, revenue income you have at the Irish National Stud, have you had to open some others more like the tourism side or the boarding side or um, the broodmares that the National Stud owns itself? Uh, yeah, so we've 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 looked at other income streams and really tried to you know try to actively invest in all facets of the business. So we've spent a lot of money on upgrading the facilities to accommodate more borders and to generate more revenue that way. We've uh, upped our, the amount of mares that we fold for clients. We've upped the amount of broodmares we have. So the broodmare band has really developed in the last five or six years. We've now got 40 high quality animals to, to send to our own stallions and to the odd outside stallion as well. And that generates a, a very good income on the yearling side. And our record of yearling sales over the past four or five years, you know, we've seen massive growth in that area and it's something we'll continue to invest in in the future. And then tourism, yeah, again, we've con consistently tried to upgrade our facilities in relation to tourism, you know, trying to promote more kids coming in involved. Mm -hmm. uh, we put on daily events, we welcomed uh, some very high profile people. Obviously, the Duchess of Cornwall visit was, was a big deal for us this year. So it's great to be in a position to continue to invest in all those things and to try and grow our numbers uh, just gradually every year is, is the plan. Okay, so we were talking about stallions there and finding new ones. I'd imagine it's really hard in the current market, is it? Yeah, it's very hard in the current market, uh, Martin, to acquire stallions, primarily because so many of them have already been acquired by the time we can get involved in the market. So if you look at the, the, the three-year-old list from the retiring, you know, or possibly would retire this year, Darley, Coolmore, al Shakab, players already involved in the stallion market, have already acquired the rights or already own mm. the uh, the animals in question. So it's a very limited pool. And I think it's it's interesting too that the sort of migration towards the French market has been interesting this year. I know you've written about yeah. that yourself. And it's something that we have to be conscious of, especially in Ireland and the UK, that the French market is becoming more and more competitive. And again, that means there are less opportunities for us to acquire stallions. So, you know, it's, it's it has been extremely difficult and it continues to be difficult to source this type of stallions that you really want. And what would you like your legacy to be as Chief Executive of the Irish National Stud? Um, my predecessor, the first horse he sold uh, as a yearling was Villas de Cour. Uh, so he had a Group 1 winner very quickly in his tenure. So I think it would be nice, I think, as a, as a starting point to breed a Group 1 winner uh, would be something special. But obviously we were in the business of trying to breed classic winners. Uh, we've had a long history of doing that, obviously back to Colonel Hall Walker having done seven of them, but See the Stars was, was the last one that was bred and raised here, so uh, certainly we'd love, to, we'd love to breed a classic winner over the next seven years, that'd be, that'd be great.